for most people think real-time communication is the most effective. But I'm here to tell you, if you want to get out of day-to-day operations, if you want to communicate less and communicate more effectively, you need to embrace what is called asynchronous communication. Hey guys, Todd here. Thanks for tuning in to the Construction Leading Edge podcast. We spend a lot of time around here talking about how do you get out of day-to-day firefighting? How do you become the CEO of a business that will run without you so you can operate truly as a visionary, so you can truly be a business owner instead of feeling like you own a job? And so today we're going to talk about a couple of things or two things that are lead dominoes to help you get out of specifically operations, day-to-day operations. But some of these things will actually even apply to communicating with clients as well. We'll get into that later. You'll even hear from a construction business owner talking about how he communicates differently with his clients and how it has freed up quite a bit of time uh, for him. So here's what you're going to take away from this one. A couple of Communication and delegation hacks to help you get out of day-to-day operations. A couple of communication and delegation hacks that will help you get out of day-to-day operations. Specifically, we're going to talk about some some problems with the human brain that are probably the root cause of some of your frustration when it comes to communicating with your team. We'll talk about a specific type of communication that's going to be a lead domino you to get out of day-to-day operations, and then how to think differently about delegation. Two specific ways to think differently about delegating to your team. All right, so let's jump into it. I'll tell you about something that happened to me in just a second, but I have to give this disclaimer first, all right? I do not recommend talking to little kids in a public restroom, but this kid gave me no choice. All right. I was at our local high school several years ago with one of my kids who was there for an event. I walked into the public restroom, and as soon as I walked in, this little voice, the voice of a little boy in one of the stalls, said, Who's out there? And I did what I thought was appropriate. I ignored this little kid because that's kind of weird. But he persisted and yelled out again, Who's out there? So I said, my name's Todd. And he didn't say anything. I guess that satisfied him. But I felt like it would be polite for him to introduce himself. So I said, my name's Todd. What's your name, little buddy? And he said, Treba. And I thought, Treba, Treba, Treba. Like That doesn't sound like a name I've ever heard before. So I said, I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time? And he's, he articulated it even more clearly, Treba. And I didn't know what he was saying, so we're in pretty deep into this relationship at this point. I, I, I needed to know, what is this kid's name? So I said, I, I'm sorry, but could you spell that for me? And the little kid was happy to oblige, and he started spelling his name T. R E V O R Treba. And I said, Ah, Trevor. Nice to meet you, Trevor. I turned to walk out of the bathroom, and what I didn't realize is that there was another little kid standing at the sink washing his hands, and he was looking straight at me like he was ready. And he looked at me, and before I could say anything, he said, My name's Logan. L-O-G-A-N, Logan. I got a little chuckle out of that. So the point is this. One of the the first keys to getting out of day-to-day operations comes down to communication. You want to be more like Logan when it comes to communication than like Trevor. Trevor didn't do a great job of communicating. But Logan, Logan was clear. Logan anticipated the question. He communicated very clearly. So you want to be more like Logan when it comes to communication. So let's talk about communication. One of the first things we need to understand is our brain is not all that helpful for us when it comes to communication. In fact, 
it is probably the root cause of a lot of communication problems. So according to psychologists, people who study the brain, our memory is very important for our survival. Our brains are good at storing specific types of information, and it's really good at storing information that helps us avoid harm, whether that's physical harm or psychological harm. Turns out that we're particularly good at remembering the things that we need to know, details that are of vital importance to our survival. For example, we're really good at remembering foods that we should avoid. For example, I had a conversation with my wife about a specific meal that we had 28 years ago that made her really sick. And she remembers that she will never again eat mussels. That's for sure. She'll never again eat mussels. So her brain cl clearly remembers never to eat mussels again for good reason. Our brains are good at remembering pathways or areas we should stick to, the people who are important to our lives. We also are pretty good at remembering experiences that trigger powerful emotions like surprise or fear, or success, happiness, or relief or anger. But this means that many of the things that we want to remember or we want other people to remember can drop out of our memory all too easily. In fact, there's something that researchers have come up with called the forgetting curve, which we'll get to in just a second. I found an interesting study. This was done, uh, yeah, the title of it was How We Remember Conversation Implications in Legal Settings. So this was done for a legal context when attorneys are cross-examining witnesses. How much, how good is our memory? So how, how much do we remember conversations? And here's what they found. After a short delay, conversational participants may recall from memory fewer than 20% of the specific ideas that were originally expressed. So in this published study, it was determined that after a short delay, people in a conversation may recall from memory fewer than 20% of the specific ideas that were originally expressed. So this is what the forgetting curve that I mentioned came up with. Imagine this curve over on the left side on the y-axis, the vertical axis, is percentage of information retained. And then on the horizontal or the x-axis is the time that has elapsed. So it's a pretty steep curve. And here's what researchers have found. It shows that within one hour, people will have forgotten an average of 50% of the information you told them. People forget, on average, 50% of what you've, you tell them an hour later. Within 24 hours, they've forgotten 70% of that information. And then within a week, forgetting claims an average of 90% of it. So one hour, people lose 50% on average. 21 day, they lose 70%. And one week later, they have lost 90%. So pause for a second and think about the time when you had a conversation with somebody on your team and you told them exactly what you wanted them to do. You explained some situation to them. And then it seemed like by the next day, that information had just evaporated from their brain. Has that ever happened? Well, the reason it seems like it disappeared from their brain is because it probably did. Or maybe you had a conversation with a customer and it was really clear in your mind, but it seems like they forgot. It's because they probably did. If it was a week later, if that conversation happened one week ago, on average, they've forgotten 90% of what you told them. So this could be over the phone, an in-person meeting. People forget because our brains are not really great at remembering details from a conversation. Remember, our brains are really good at keeping us alive. Your brain is good at keeping you alive. Your employees' brains are really good at keeping them alive, not so good at remembering details. So let's talk about one of the lead dominoes that will solve this. This is a little bit counterintuitive. It may be exactly the opposite of what you think. You may be thinking, all right, well, if people are forgetting 
50% of what I'm telling them within an hour, that means I need to talk more. I need to just saturate them with details and I need to tell them exactly what to do. Well, one of the lead dominoes, one of the things that you can focus on that will make this problem easier to solve, make this problem go away, is a little counterintuitive. And we'll talk about a lead domino for communication and then another couple of lead dominoes for delegation. And they are the opposite of what a lot of people do. And the first one, when it comes to communication, is that you need to communicate less. That's right. You need to communicate less. If you want to get out of day-to-day -day operations, you need to communicate with your team less. Because as we just uncovered, if, if you're having phone conversations, in-person conversations, meetings with people, and you're just talking about things, they're losing 70% of that information in one day. So what do we do about this? The first strategy goes back, well, let's talk about the opposite of this strategy. If you remember back in the early 2000s, maybe late, like 98, early 2000s, people had Nextel phones. Do you remember these Nextel phones? I think it was probably early 2000s. It would chirp, had this uh, push to talk feature that was like a walkie talkie and a, and a cell phone together and it would beep beep. And then somebody could just start talking. I've been in meetings where someone's phone went off and somebody on the other end, usually running a noisy piece of equipment or standing next to a circular saw, would just start talking really loudly in the middle of this meeting. It was the most, it was real-time communication at its worst. Real-time communication. So two types of communication. There's real-time communication, which is phone call, in-person meeting, live communication where both people need to be there. And that's just not that effective. However, most people think real-time communication is the most effective. But I'm here to tell you, if you want to get out of day-to-day -day operations, if you want to communicate less and communicate more effectively, you need to embrace what is called asynchronous communication. Asynchronous communication. And what that means is when the it's the opposite of real-time communication. It means both people or all of the people communicating don't need to be there. Another example of a of real-time communication is a conference call or an online meeting where everybody needs to be there. So asynchronous communication is when someone can post a piece of information or post a question and then it can sit there for a while until the other person or the other people can read that information, listen to that information, watch that information, and respond. So there are a couple of forms of asynchronous communication that a lot of people use. Text messages are asynchronous. Emails should be asynchronous. A lot of people end up playing text and email ping pong back and forth, which is not that effective. Um, so if we think about what some of the problems with real-time communication, like phone calls and meetings, even to some extent, emails and texts, they're interruptions. If it's real-time, that means it has to be an interruption. It has to interrupt what you're doing for you to be in real-time communication. They disappear. The information vaporizes from our brain. We already talked about that. It requires, if you really want it to stick, you have a phone call or a conversation with someone, then you have to immediately follow it up and document it per our conversation, et cetera, et cetera. They get lost. If it's a text or an email, then it's that if you ever need to find that information, it's in somebody's phone or in someone's email account. If it's a past employee, that information's gone and you can never find it again. There's no record of it. And you know if there's ever a dispute, he or she who has the best documentation wins the dispute, right? So when you think about asynchronous communication, asynchronous communication would be, for example, daily logs. Daily log 
of the activity that happened on the job site, the conversations that took place, the the weather, who was working on the site, logging all of the activity on a job each day, and then posting it in your project management software. We'll talk about how to think about your project management software in just a second. But you're pushing information out. You're posting information in a daily log, sharing it with your team, sharing it with your customers, maybe even sharing it with your trade partners, pushing information out that they can consume when they need to. Tasks and to-dos, whether you use Builder Trend, Co-Construct, some sort of to-do software, Asana, Job Nimbus, Monday.com is a good one. You can create tasks and to-dos in your system where there's something you want done or a, a task you want to delegate to somebody. You type it up instead of telling them over the phone, hey, go do this for me, or or calling them and telling them to do something. You post it somewhere that they can see it later on when they have a, a chance, doesn't interrupt them, and there's a record of it in a way you can track it. One of my favorite ways to do training is much more effective than the old way, right? Let's say you're going to train someone in the office to work on a, spe- a specific piece of software, okay? A couple of different approaches that don't work really well for that. One would be to say, hey, here's our software. Get after it. Go learn it and then let them just figure it out on their own. Another one would be to say, oh, you have a, if you have a question, let me know. And then someone that your new hire comes to you and says, hey, how do I update this or where do I find this information? And you say, thanks for interrupting me. Let me show you. And then you show them how to do it. You stop what you're doing, you show them how to do it. And then how much of that information are they going to retain? Right? We already talked about that. So then a few weeks later or a few months later, when they need to do that again, they come to you and say, hey, could you show me this again? And you say, thanks for interrupting me. I would be happy to stop what I'm doing and answer this question a second time for you. Right? I'm sure that's what you're thinking. Everybody loves interruptions. Everybody loves answering the question more than once. So here's what I would encourage you to do. Find a post-it note and write these words on a post-it note. How can this be the last time I answer this question? How can this be the last time I answer this question? And then put that post-it note up on your computer monitor or on your wall so that the next time someone comes to you and asks you a question, instead of stopping what you're doing and answering it for the first time, knowing you'll probably have to answer it a few more times after that, you say, send that question to me and I'll record a Loom video. That's right. You can go to loom.com. It's a screen recording software and you can record your screen and narrate what you're doing and then post that recording somewhere and either put it in a library of training information or you can send it to somebody and then you are going to communicate with them asynchronously. They'll send you a question and then when you have time, you can take the time to record it once and you can answer this question one last time in the form of a Loom video. Then when someone asks you that question, you can say, go check the Loom video library or a great place to keep track of these Loom videos is in your process document. If you realize everything is in your head, if all of your processes, all of your expectations, how you estimate, how you negotiate, how you sell, how you set up a project, who's going to do what, what you expect people to do. If everything is locked away in your head, then does your team have any other option other than to ask you what to do? No, they have no option because there's nothing for them to refer to. You are the manual because it's all locked away in your head. 
And if you're frustrated by all the phone calls and texts and emails and interruptions you're getting from your team asking you how to do stuff, then you need to realize it's your fault because that's where the information is locked away. You have chosen to secure all of the intellectual property of your business in your head. And the only way people can get to it is to ask you questions, which makes it think about the ripple effects of that. If you're getting phone calls and people sticking their head in your office all day long and getting text messages and, and people wanting to meet with you all the time, it's probably preventing you from doing the stuff you really want to be doing. And to some degree, it's handcuffing you to the business. I think about the ripple effects of the fact that everything's locked away in your head. Can you ever get away from the business? Probably not. So what you need to do is document your processes, or as my Canadian friends would say, your processes. You need to have a documented process. And this is a great place to put links to Loom videos, checklists, templates in a process document. Get it out of your head and into a process document. So you are communicating asynchronously. Which would you rather do? Spend a couple of hours once documenting a process and then share it with your team, or over the next five years, answer that same question over and over and over and maybe give different answers each time and then have to answer it in real time, have to be interrupted from what you're doing, which would you prefer to do? It makes a lot of sense to just invest the time to create your process document once That's a form of asynchronous communication. Get it out of your head, put it into a process document one time, and then send everyone on your team to that document. That should be the first place they go instead of calling you. So asynchronous communication is an absolute lead domino. It's absolutely crucial for you to get away from your business because you can't get away. You can't get away for a three-day weekend. You can't get away for a vacation. You can't ever sell your business if you are constantly communicating in real time. If your team has to try to access the information in your head, they have no other alternative but to do that. So if you want to get out of your business, make it run without you, maybe sell it one day, or even just take a vacation, start communicating asynchronously. Another lead domino to help you get out of day-to-day operations is to think differently about delegation. A lot of people think about this wrong. They delegate tasks, or as one of my clients called it, task saturation. They're just saturating their people with tasks, little micro tasks. Hey, call this person. I need you to order this material. I need you to call this person, ask them a question, and bring it back to me. Right, That's a great example of delegating a task. Do this, go here, bring it all back to me. And if you think about your organizational chart, if you even have one, if you think about how your organization runs, if you are like a wagon wheel and you're the, the hub in the middle of the wagon wheel and everything comes through you and you're giving out tasks all communications coming to you, every question comes to you, every decision comes to you, then you are probably guilty of delegating tasks. And there's a better way. And actually, if you want to get out of your business, if you want your business to run without you, you have to delegate results. If you want your business to run without you, you have to delegate results. Start delegating results and stop delegating tasks. So one of the best ways to do that is to design your accountability chart, okay? Delegating results starts by designing your accountability chart. So an accountability chart will do quite a few things for you. And when I say an accountability chart, this is establishing clearly defined outcomes for each major function of your business. Clearly defined lanes, so to speak, clearly defined responsibilities, so that if someone, whatever role someone is in, they know exactly what results they are accountable for delivering. So this will 
decentralized decisions. Instead of you making all the decisions because you're holding all the results, you're accountable for all the results, and you're just delegating tasks, you're going to shift that and you're going to delegate results out to your superintendents, to your project manager, and to your pre-construction director, and to your crew leaders, and to your office manager, and to your finance and accounting manager. You're going to delegate results and outcomes to them. And then you're going to push the decisions out to them. So they're making the decisions necessary to achieve those results. When you do this, you'll have what we call a culture of accountability. Culture of accountability, where people are accountable for delivering results. They're holding each other accountable. They know what it, what they're accountable for and what they're not, so that when someone comes to them and says, hey, can you do this? They can say, you're accountable for that. That's not me. That's what you are accountable for. You have clearly defined lanes, clearly defined responsibilities. And this eliminates a lot of chaos. What I find is when there are not clearly defined lanes, there are a couple of things. There are starving horses, which goes back to an old saying I heard years ago that the best way to starve a horse is to have two people feed it. The best way to starve a horse is to have two people feed it. Have you ever noticed that if if two or three people are responsible for something, then nobody's responsible. There's a lot of finger pointing going on. So either nothing gets done, the horse starves because two or three people thought the other person was doing it, or you have people stepping on each other's toes, duplicating activities, wasting time and energy, answering questions, three, four, five people answering the same question from the client, three or four or five people all talking to the same trade partner, often giving conflicting answers, setting off this domino effect of chaos. That's what happens. So when you eliminate that, you have clearly defined lanes, then you can do a lot more with less. You can do a lot more with less. Someone contacted me a few months ago, the business owner who was a custom home builder and said, My superintendents need time management training. They need help managing their time. And as we dug into it and really got to the root cause, there was a lack of time. But the reason there was a lack of time was because of all the chaos. There were multiple people doing the same thing, wasting time, wasting energy, duplicating efforts. And what they needed to do was clearly define lanes and also clearly define their pre-construction process to eliminate a lot of that chaos. But that's that's a whole separate topic. Once you have your culture of accountability in place, you have clearly defined lanes, clearly defined accountability for results, it's going to allow you to have more time, more time to steer the ship, to really operate as the CEO. You'll know if there's an issue, who to address it with, who's accountable for it, and Because all this chaos has been reduced, phone calls are being reduced, you'll be able to have more time to work on the business. We've heard from some of our clients that their phone rings 50% less than it used to. They have more time. And then it will allow you to truly delegate results. It will be a tool and a map you can use to delegate results to your team. So design your accountability chart, delegate results. The other lead domino for delegation is to understand that delegation is not all or nothing. It's not zero or 100%. A lot of people, I think, believe, well, I, it's either I, I do all of it or they do it 100%. And that leads to some serious problems. So typically, people just hang on to it. Or they micromanage, which is problematic also. So you have to understand there are five levels of delegation. There is a progression of delegation. So imagine a stair step with five steps on it. And the lowest level of delegation is, level one delegation is do exactly what I've told you. Just do exactly what I've told you. Go do this. Just 
what some would call gopher level delegation. Go for this, go for that, do exactly what I tell you. That is level one. Level two delegation is research the topic and report back to me. Research the topic and report back to me. This is where when you would use level two delegation is you're telling someone, hey, here's an issue, problem we're having, or some material we need, for example, let's say, hey, we need to we need to find this specific material. I would like for you to do research and bring the research back to me. I'll make the decision. I just need you to gather the information and bring it to me. All right. Level three delegation would be in that using that same example. We need this material. I want you to go gather information, gather some some pricing, gather some research, gather get some shipping times and availability, and then I want you to make a recommendation and come back to me with the information and your recommendation. That's level three is make a recommendation. And then we'll decide together. All right, so level one, do exactly what I've told you. Level two, research the topic and report back to me. Level three is make a recommendation. And then level four would be decide and report back after you've made the decision. Level four is to decide and report back. So in this case, it would be, hey, we need this material. I want you to go gather the information. I want you to pick what you want to do. And then I want you to decide. You make the decision and then tell me what your decision was after the fact. That's level four delegation. And then level five delegation, which is true, complete autonomy, is decide without reporting back. Here's something that needs to happen. Go take care of it. You don't have to check in with me. I trust your judgment. And speaking of trust, as people ascend this progression of delegation from level one, do exactly what I've told you, to level two, research the topic and report back. Level three, make a recommendation. Level four, decide and report back. Level five, decide without reporting back. As people ascend that stair step of uh, progression, it requires more and more trust. And the interesting thing about trust is that trust is one of the strongest motivators of humans. When we feel trusted, it is one of the things that motivates us the most. By giving people trust and autonomy, you'll help them find another gear. Let me say that again. As you extend trust and people feel trusted, you will help them find another gear because that is one of the things that motivates us the most is feeling of being trusted and and having autonomy, having control over how we're doing things in our day-to-day lives. All right. So to recap, lead dominoes to help you get out of day-to-day operations, get out of your business is number one, communicate less and communicate asynchronously. Next, when it comes to delegation, is to delegate results and outcomes instead of tasks. And then understand the five levels of delegation, that there is a progression. And your job as the leader is to match the task with the person and then always try to stretch your people up to the next level. Because think about it. On one end of the spectrum, if you are, if you're basically delegating, treating everyone on your team at level one delegation, do exactly what I tell you, that's delegating tasks. How will you ever be able to step away from your business if you are operating at level one delegation with everyone? Also, how does that make your team feel? If you have someone who's really experienced and you're treating them and delegating them at level one delegation, what does that do to them? If you're telling them exactly what to do, how does that make them feel? And then what might happen if you continue to treat them at that level? Continue to keep someone who should be at a level four or five, if you're keeping them and holding them down at a level one, what's going to happen? Now, imagine what it would be like if, you could delegate at a level four or five. You have people on your team operating at a level four 
where they're deciding and reporting back, or even level five, where they're just taking care of problems because they know exactly what they're accountable for. They know exactly what is in their lane, and they are at level five, deciding without reporting back. They're just taking care of things. What would that do for you, right? So those are some lead dominoes and a few communication hacks that you can use to help you get out of your business. So if if you want to run a construction business that runs without you, if you want to be the CEO of a business you can step away from, whether it's to take a three-day weekend or a two-week vacation without checking email, without taking phone calls the whole time, Maybe you want to be the visionary. Maybe you're a visionary. You have lots of great ideas, but you're stuck in the day-to-day, and you really want to operate as a visionary in your business. Then you have to be able to delegate results. And the best way to delegate results, as I mentioned, is to design your accountability chart. The best way to delegate results is to design your accountability chart. And I'm here to tell you that using your accountability chart to design your business for the future, designing your business just the way you want it to work. We're not talking about documenting how things are now. I'm talking about designing your business just the way you want it to be. Designing your accountability chart for the future, it's absolutely necessary. Here's what it's going to do for you. It will clearly define who is accountable for what results. And if I had to pick one word, one word for what the accountability chart will do, it is clarity. The accountability chart equals clarity. Clarity for the team on who's accountable for what results. Clarity on lanes, clarity on roles and responsibilities, clarity on expectations, clarity on expectations. Clarity for you on do you have the right people in the right seat? Do you have the right people on the bus? It will also provide a lot of clarity for you around what the next hire needs to be. Do you need to hire? What does that next hire need to be? Then there'll be clarity for your team and new hires on what their career path looks like in the company. I've heard it said that people lose hope when they run out of future. People lose hope when they run out of future. So with the accountability chart, it provides clarity on for a new hire. Oh, I'm going to come in at this role. And then the next step is this role. And this is what it's going to take to get to that role. So it provides a clear cut career path, what it's, what the future looks like. Okay. Up next is a brief interview with Andy Shelton the owner of Birch Home Builders. He recently completed our Systematize Your Construction Business Program, or as we call it, SYCB. And here's what you're going to learn. Here's what you'll you'll hear Andy talking about in this brief interview. Um, Speaking of communication, he talks about what happened when they changed their approach to client communication, how the program was a bit like a cheat code. He explains that a little bit more. He also talks about the mindset change that they experienced as a leadership team, and then one big change to how they do pre-construction. If you'd like to hear other construction business owners talk about their experience in our Systematize Your Construction Business program, you can head over to constructionleadingedge.com and click on the results tab. That's constructionleadingedge.com and click on the results tab. Now, let's listen to this brief interview with Andy. All right, Ashley and Andy, A-Team, thank you so much for joining today. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and your business? All right. I'm Andy Shelton. I'm Ashley McEntee. And um, we we work at Birch Home Builders, and we're a custom home builder in Columbia, South Carolina. Very nice. Thank you. And before you join the SYCB program, can you tell us a little bit about the problems that you were having in your business? Yeah, sure. Um, so we had grown a lot. There was actually pretty good growth during during the COVID years, I guess. And um, but as we grew, we added teammates and sort of just plugged gaps where we could. 
and where we thought was most pressing, but um, we just felt like we weren't being as efficient as we probably could be. And um, we were just looking to sort of systemize things and uh, put some type of controls in place, some metrics to measure if we're even doing good or not. Okay, great. And when you say that you knew you had these systems that you wanted to have in place, and it, I'm kind of like envisioning a, a dam with little holes and you're like sticking fingers in all these little holes. Is that kind of the experience you were having before and, and the stress that you were feeling in those problems? Yeah, we had just hired and um, but really didn't have like formal job titles or descriptions and um, just sort of brought on some people when we needed. And that was great. There was nothing wrong with the people, but trying to get them in, in the right spot and knowing what they're doing, knowing what a good day for them looks like. Yeah. And um, just giving us, yeah, trying to turn it more into a company that we could scale and that if someone new came in, we, we'd have, you know, a process and something to give them to say, this is basically who Birch is and this is how Birch does things. Yeah. 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 Okay. I think we're looking for a lot more guidance and just a, a proactive approach versus a reactive where we're just working, working, working and solving problems, but never creating a business. Yeah. And so in that working, I imagine there were a lot of hours, <laughs> a lot of late nights and things like that. What what was the worst part about all of that for you in the frustrations that you were facing before? Some of this is a lot of its hours. You know, we all have families. And so we wanted to be able to define, you know, when we're working and when we're not. Yeah, I think a, a lot of a stress kind of sometimes you feel like you're all over the place and and there's not a, a defined path and easily get distracted. You're looking this way while something else is going on here and it gets lost in the mix. Yeah, I think one thing that was frustrating is we were putting in a lot of hours and we always had the best intentions, but it it wasn't always I didn't feel like the clients really saw that or uh, maybe they felt that things were hectic. And so getting communication plan in place, um, we were building houses in good time. And so that was frustrating when I know we're, our quality is good and I know our time frame is good and our price is good. And yet somehow some of the clients would still feel some type of disappointment. And so it was really trying to get, you know, to try to help figure out how to get a better experience to them. So they would understand the value that I knew we were delivering. Yeah. 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 So I'm hearing, you know, a lot of a lot of chaos, a lot of frustration, knowing that you had a good quality product and wanting to create and deliver a great experience, but just feeling like you had so much going on that it was hard to really focus in and, and hone in on that. Exactly. And I think that I mean we talked a lot about it because it's not an inexpensive program. And so we talked a lot about, you know, what are our options here? But um, our thought was we could probably figure out whatever this program will teach us in the next 10 years, but how much time would we lose? And, you know, by that point, our kids would be pretty old. And um, we just felt like it was, I don't want to say a cheat code, but a little bit like we could pay this and purchase this experience versus learn it on our own over the next little bit. And so it was just sort of a kind of a financial choice. Like either way, you're basically going to spend a lot of money figuring <laughs> out how to be a better business. And this turned out to probably be a lot cheaper than hard lessons for the next five or 10 years, you know, <laughs> and a lot shorter time frame as well. Right. <laughs> yeah, a whole lot shorter. Yeah, that's true. Absolutely. So now that you've been through the program and, and, you know, you were in that for a few different weeks, tell us a point within the program that you thought, wow, this is really going to help us. This is going to enhance and make our business better. I mean, I, we can both answer if you want, but for me, it'd probably be the team meeting because that's maybe a little bit before halfway through, but it was definitely a good month in. And the three main people in the business are participating in this program and knew what was going on and knew what we were going for. But then to share it sort of with everyone. And, um, and then we learned some things like throughout that meeting and we really shaped up what our process ended up becoming in that meeting. Um, and it took some time to kind of figure it out and implement it. But yeah, I would say kind of bringing the rest of the company in on what we had been working on was probably where I felt pretty excited about it, you know? Yeah. I think I first realized um, when we got our first pre-construction agreement. And then I was like, oh, wow. Like, <laughs> yeah, these guys have been working so hard. 
all on the front end and nobody's ever really getting compensated for that time if the client decides they want to walk away. So that was, I think that was the best part, getting that first agreement. Very cool. So through the Nail the Handoff team session, which was a point where you were able to really bring your whole team together. And there's always a pretty cool energy that happens when you're able to do that and get people bought in and excited about creating what that process looks like. And then of course the pre-construction agreement, those are both really pivotal moments for you and your business. Tell me a little bit about what you think, and maybe this answers it, what is the most impactful or beneficial part of SYCB for you? I mean, those two things are definitely the highlight and what we were seeking, but I really, um, I think, Probably in general, we talked a little bit about this in the last meeting, but really just um, a mindset change and a discipline within the leadership of the company to focus on the business, at least for, you know, some parts of the week and try to um, have scheduled times to get out of the field and um, get creative with what our opportunities are, what we could be doing better and work on these metrics and these systems that we've established in the program. So probably... Uh, yeah, probably my mindset change of to to work on building the business, not just building homes. Yeah, very cool. Working on the business versus in the business. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah. how is life different for you? Uh, I know there's still some implementation and refinement to happen uh, as you continue to work on this, but tell me a little bit about how things are different for you from the beginning of when the, pro- the program started until now. Well, we get paid for pre-construction, so that's good. <laughs> I feel probably like there's a defined path as well. Yeah, we have a better a better path for sure. Um, the homes were always a good. There was always a schedule there, um, but how we sort of got to the start of construction has improved dramatically, and then getting paid for that was beneficial. I'm trying to think how else. I mean, I, I don't know a lot of a lot of things. I, I, I think you know we have a I have a good vision of what things are going that they'll continue to even get better. But I would say we work less now than we did, although we still work a lot. But that's a good thing, and that things are busy. Mm-hmm. Um, um, probably client expectation. The most immediate thing I saw was when we started implementing a more proactive communication. We went from you know just. Anytime the client called, we'd wonder like, oh, or at least I would think like, oh, gosh, something's probably wrong or whatever. And a lot of times they just wanted to know what was going on. And um, so I would say client communication in terms of them calling us has cut down. And and when you start delivering the communication early and you're driving it, it's a much shorter conversation than when you're explaining uh, what's been going on versus telling them what is and what's about to be going on. So that was probably the most immediate thing I noticed was happier clients, a lot less calling us, questioning what's going on, and uh, us controlling the process better and remaining the expert because yeah. you're always the expert. I mean, if they sign a contract with you, hopefully they feel that way. But then sometime or at some some builds, at some point over the 10 months or however long it's taken to build, the trust can start to slip. And, and, and I think a lot of it was just not communicating us doing again doing a good job delivering on a good timeline yeah. but everybody wants to know what's going on when they're spending decent money and uh so that was probably the biggest immediate impact i would say yeah There's more trust from the clients and therefore less questioning and more us driving the communication well i think that's really a product of what you and your leadership team have done in meeting more regularly and having that regular communication among you as well as the communication within your team It all just really spills over into that client expectations and the experience that they they have. And uh, it sounds like that's all been really good in a very positive way. For sure. Yeah. Awesome. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to share with us about your SYCB experience? I feel like we've covered most of it. I mean, I'm saying if someone's considering, it's definitely worth calling and 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 talking to you guys about what the different options are. And there's some different paths y'all offer, but for us, it was worth it. And I don't even think we've gotten the full value out of it yet because we have all that material. So all that we've gone through it, we'll continue to build and continue to implement and strengthen it. And it gave us a skill set and sort of a way to think about the business that will only make things better. So I think it was worth it now. And then a year from now, who knows where we'll be, but I know we'll be more organized than we are now. And we're dramatically more organized than we were when we started. So it's good. It's been really good. Very good. 
Well, thank you both so much. It was absolute pleasure to be able to coach you and to, to guide you through the last several weeks. I very much enjoyed it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you.